I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 90. I've noticed in this building too, by the way, that it is a very Baptist feeling building, um, not only by uh, some picture of our county behind us, a little stage, but also the very front row is empty as the deacons scramble for more chairs at the back. Um, but again, just part of, I think we're, we find humor in those things, but at the same time, we're reminded of God's provision for us that uh, the city, uh, in seeing how they double booked, we're here because the city wanted to make sure that it did not disrupt our, our Lord's Day gathering. That's a huge blessing. And even the city's approved 2025 for us to gather in the community center and even made provisions for us to be in here in weeks that aren't possible. So that's a real blessing. And so again, as we consider prayer this morning, we ought to pray for those in the city as Josh did this morning. But let's go to Psalm chapter 90. We're going to read verses 12 through 17 this morning. And so hear the word of our great God. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And may God bless the reading of his word and apply its truths upon our hearts this morning. Now, today, as you may obviously have noted, we are looking at the importance of prayer. And this subject has really been at the forefront of my mind the last several weeks. Many of you know, uh, over the next month or so, the elders have graciously given me a time of rest. And as I have thought on that, often my mind will be given to what books could I study? And really, uh, I long to enter that time really reflecting on the importance of prayer. And Psalm 90, among others, has been a great encouragement to me. In fact, one of you gave me a little book um, by Michael Reeves called Authentic Ministry, of which encourages prayer in the life of the Christian. Uh, Reeves in his book says, the first and main true way of faith expressing itself is through prayer. For in true prayer, we actually depend upon God and trust him. That is exercising faith. In prayer, we show how much we really want communion with God and how much we really depend upon God. Now again, as we read these final verses in Psalm 90, this is exactly what we find presented and worked out by Moses in Psalm 90. Again, if you notice at the top of your Bible in Psalm 90, it says it is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And this is not simply an addition added in. This is part of Psalm 90. And so we find Moses offering up genuine prayer to God Almighty and really conveying how much he desires communion with God and full dependence upon him. Again, I think it's often important when we come to the Psalms to consider the possible historical context even. Not only that this is Moses speaking, but in what context could Moses be speaking? Again, there are other passages like Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32, which record songs that Moses sings. But Psalm 90 is uniquely a prayer. And it seems this psalm was penned, I would say, in light of much history that we find in the book of Numbers as the people often were complaining and rebelling against Moses and even against the Lord, where Moses would intercede and he would intercede before the Lord that he would turn back from his wrath and cause the people to walk and delight in his holy presence and righteous fear. And so there seems to be this 
connection in a sense to Psalm 90 here and in the whole book of Numbers for really the instruction of sinners to more soberly live in light of eternity. In fact, among the things that have been said about Psalm 90, Matthew Henry believed that Moses penned this prayer really in light of the history of the book of Numbers in a way that was intended to be used as a prayer daily in the life of the people and maybe even in the life of the tabernacle ministry by the priests in the wilderness. But again, Israel's rebellion, remember, was not simply a momentary frustration or issue. Their hearts were continually evil and rebellious against God. Even we find at the beginning of Numbers chapter 14 that they wanted to turn back to Egypt and they even appointed a different leader. They wanted to appoint a different leader, excuse me, than Moses. In fact, in verses 8 through 12 of Numbers 14, they were instructed to listen to the Lord and to trust him because he would ultimately faithfully lead them into the land that he had promised. Again, in Numbers 14, we find that Joshua and Caleb said to the people, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Again, the book of Numbers is quite a profound and intense book. In fact, in in Numbers chapter 20, the whole chapter is filled with grief and disobedience and the judgment of God. In fact, if you have come to read the book of Numbers, chapter 20 begins with Moses' sister dying. And then in the middle, we see Moses' anger in striking the rock and God's judgment and discipline for his unbelief. And Numbers 20 even concludes with Moses' brother Aaron dying. And even the very next chapter in Numbers 21, as Israel had rebelled with evil hearts, we see the judgment and the wrath of God poured out in the fiery serpent's and his grace in the bronze serpent lifted up by Moses. And so in all of this, in all of this history that we've briefly looked at, we are reminded as we survey the book of Numbers that death and judgment are inescapable. In fact, just a few weeks earlier, we had read in Hebrews 9 that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Because death is inescapable, it is important that we have wisdom and humility about life and death. And so really, as Moses and Miriam and Aaron were the last of the generation who came out of Egypt, you can imagine then in Moses' life that prayer and reflection is quite crucial at the end of his days. Again, this is what I believe is really the broad historical context in which Moses prays the words of verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Again, there's something to be said about those who have a sober view of death and a humble outlook on life. And again, certainly at times, I think we have, we may find that non-believers seem to have a type of sober view and humble outlook at times, both on life and death. 
But it's only the believer who has come to find the source of a heart of wisdom. Again, notice in verse 11 earlier, Moses says, if only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Again, this was quite important in Moses' prayer. In fact, the first time we hear of this fear in the scriptures is back in Genesis chapter 20, when King Abimelech had taken Sarah from Abraham. And in verse 11 of Genesis 20, Abraham had said to Abimelech, that the reason he hid the truth that Sarah was his wife was because, as he said, there is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Again, church, where there is no holy fear of God, there is no delight and reverence for the holy name of the Lord. There is no genuine humility and wisdom, and nor is there a sober outlook on life and death. And so just as Moses does, we ought to pray, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Again, far too often, I think we have our eyes upon ourselves. We have our eyes upon ourselves, which really results in having a high view of our days and our lives and a low view of the fear of the Lord and the reverence for the Lord. And so really, this is why we ought to pray that we would genuinely commune with God and be reminded how much we are dependent upon Him. Again, I think Christians who have suffered, who have suffered much and have suffered well, they have truly learned what it means to number their days and to have a heart of wisdom. They see with a type of genuine humility because their lives are fixed on eternity, not the momentary pains and troubles. They realize life is short, death is inevitable, and the fear of the Lord is the source of true and lasting wisdom. Again, as we find back in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so simply put, church, a heart of wisdom is a believing heart that fears the Lord. Again, I think, honestly, we don't need more theology on this. We simply need to take our eyes off of ourselves and what we hope life can offer, what we hope we can gain in the moment so that we would actually apply the theology we have already been taught concerning this wonderful and biblical fear of the Lord. Because understand, like Israel in the wilderness, our need is not for God to be more clear in his word. Our true need is to really have a heart of wisdom that seeks to delight in and obey and fear the Lord. That's what should be evident in our lives and in our living. Even as Paul urges the believers in Ephesians chapter 5, saying in verse 15 and 16, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Again, church, the faithfulness and promises of God and even the good and holy character of God ought to motivate the Christian to genuine prayers and humble living. Again, notice even back in verse 1 and 2 where Moses begins. It's by saying, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's the perspective we need. Far too often today, you come across Christians who when they pray, they pray in a type of cultural way. They don't know how to pray scripture. Scripture. 
And they don't know how to pray what's true of God. And so both in our prayers and in our living, we need to remember God is God. He alone has immortality. He is dwelling in light that no one can approach. He is unchangeable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible. He is almighty. In every way, he is infinite and absolutely holy. He is perfectly wise, holy, free, and completely absolute. He works all things, the scriptures tell us, according to the counsel of his own unchangeable and completely righteous will. And he does all of this for his own glory. And so again, just as Moses is praying in light of all that God is and the faithfulness and the goodness of his character and promises, we ought to respond with humble hearts that are repentant and reverent before God Almighty. Again, notice that Moses has begun with the character of God. Seeing how vast and good God is and how man is not. And so notice that as we look at verses 13 through 15, Moses is turning to pray several petitions before the Lord. In fact, in verse 13, he prayed, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Now again, in both Moses' intercession of Exodus 32 and the song that he sings in Deuteronomy 32, Moses had pleaded and really sang to the Lord that faithless sinners are entirely dependent upon the one true faithful God. And I think we're reminded in this that man does not make himself right with God. It is God alone who chooses to be compassionate, to show mercy, and to justify his people. Again, notice first in Exodus 32 that Moses interceded before God for disobedient Israel. And he said, turn, O Lord, from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Again, when Moses prays, return, O Lord, how long? It is not simply a poetic statement. It is by experience that Moses cries out to the Lord and says, return to us. Even in Deuteronomy 32, verse 36, Moses saying, the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Now again, Like the terror and worry that often comes upon people when the daylight is gone and the darkness comes, Israel had known firsthand what it meant for the Lord in his judgment to remove his presence from them. It would be like being in a fully lit space and all of a sudden like that, it is pitch black and you are alone. It was like utter darkness. And so their longing in such times of God's discipline and judgment upon them was always to be on them praying for the Lord to return and remember. Lord, return to us. Remember your faithfulness. Remember your goodness. And just as we find in Psalm 30, verse 5, The psalmist says his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Again, Israel was always to have their eyes set on the great and awesome day where the light would shine in the darkness and the darkness would never again overcome it. Now, Many of you already know these are the words of the Gospel of John. 
where the Apostle John shows us the great light is Christ. When the person who cries out to God says, return, how long? The light that comes to the repentant sinner is Christ. And so, friends, we ought to pray, Lord, may you turn, turn to us and have compassion on your servants. And also notice in verse 14, almost as if following this theme of darkness and light, Moses prays, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Friends, we ought to find our greatest satisfaction in the faithful, immovable, and perfect love of the Lord. Now again, there are so many distractions. This is why we need such wonderful scriptural reminders on prayer. Even sitting in the corner there while Pastor Josh was praying the pastoral prayer, I briefly opened my eyes and was just overwhelmed by all of the content in this corner of how much there are instructions and information, and we are often distracted. And so we're reminded that our satisfaction, what our eyes and our hearts are fixed upon, ought to be the Lord himself. And this is important because the anxious soul who does not seek to be satisfied in the steadfast love of the Lord will actually be miserable and sad all their days. And really, this is because their satisfaction is not founded upon what is true and good in God. Their minds and their hearts are not focused on him. This is what is the issue in the anxious soul. They are fixed on themselves and their own condition. And yet Moses teaches us here that our prayers ought to be filled with the same as his own. Lord, satisfy us. Again, simply put, church, if the root of our satisfaction is not based on the faithful immovable, perfect love of the Lord, then are we ever rejoicing or glad? Are those things of which are evident in our life? Again, the love of God in Christ is the root of our rejoicing and gladness as believers. Because in Christ, we have come to know how steadfast, how true, how unconditional and faithful God's love is towards sinners like us. And just as Paul reminds us in Romans 8, showing us how good and perfect God's love is, in verse 39, he says, neither height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what produces rejoicing and gladness. And so church, we ought to pray. We ought to pray with our eyes fixed upon the text of Psalm 90, praying, Lord, satisfy us in the love of our Savior, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. See, when we have that perspective, our hope and our satisfaction is fixed on the Lord. That's where it ought to be. But even when we face difficulties of life, and we will, because in the Christian life, it's not an if, it's a when. So even when we face the difficulties of life or the evils of this age, our desires are to be rooted in the goodness and mercy of the Lord. Again, notice in verse 15 that Moses prays, make us glad For as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. That's a very interesting thing to pray. And I think it's very easy to become beat down by the troubles of life, the depravity of sin. Again, many of you who are older than me know that when you're in your teens, you think you'll never get to your 20s. And when you're in your 20s, You wish you were in your 30s and your 40s. And when you're in your 30s and your 40s, you wish you were 20. 
And that perspective is so important. And I think the Christian is most helped at times by suffering. We're reminded that, the, that as Moses prays, he says, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. Again, many of you are beat down by the troubles of life, the depravity of sin in the world. But sometimes in our struggling and our suffering, I think we forget that the Lord is often directing all these things for his own glory and our good. Again, Moses had even reminded Israel of this reality and purpose in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He had told them in verse 3, The Lord humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Friends, are there troubles and afflictions in your life? Maybe those things the Lord is actually allowing and directing to remind you how dependent you are upon him. Again, I don't think anything in all of the world is senseless. And so could those sleepless nights actually be the Lord giving you time to pray? Could the consuming health concerns, the anxieties, the pains you feel be an evidence of your utter dependence upon the Lord? And could the Lord actually be directing your affliction that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. Church, we ought to pray and ask the Lord to make us glad, not for the affliction, but how he is working in and through it. Not because of any good and perfect circumstances, but in spite of those things, that we might come to know and be glad and delight in the truth that man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. See, we ought to trust and delight in the Lord that even if and when we suffer or struggle with all sorts of difficulties, we would be glad for how God is directing all things for his own glory. Again, I've never met a, a mature Christian who says, I'm thankful for this trouble. I'm thankful for these things. But often you hear those who walk through suffering, who walk through trials and are mature in the faith. They will say, I am thankful for how God is faithful. Again, we ought not to ask the Lord, take us out of this struggle. But Lord, walk with us through it. Again, I'm often reminded of the old hymn, the writer says, whatever my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know he will not leave me. I take content what he hath sent. His hand can turn my griefs away. And patiently, I wait his day. Church, I have sang that hymn and read those words over and over and over again throughout the years. And while at times the Lord has not at all changed my trials, taken away my temptations, or removed my own afflictions, he has led my heart to praise and say with gladness, whatever my God ordains is right. Again, friends, in all that we do, we ought to be satisfied in Christ. We ought to be content in all that the Lord gives and allows, even if that includes suffering and death. Again, I think we often are wrestling with the question, what do we do when we forget? Especially, what do we do when a brother or sister in Christ forgets and they have neglected or we have neglected the Lord in, in our own prayers? I think we pray. We 
ask the Lord that he would remind us and that he would show us his faithful, redemptive work throughout history. Regardless of how much we change or we're fickle, that God is unchanging. Again, I think we see this as Moses prays in verse 16. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Now, friends, the the greatest work of the Lord, which all people everywhere are called to trust in and look upon in faith, is the gospel. See, since the fall in the garden, the gospel was first revealed to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman. And afterwards, it was revealed by further steps until the fullness of it had come in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so that ought to be the prayer for the people of God in every generation. Lord, reveal your redemptive work to us that we might see your glorious power in the gospel. See, just as the Lord brought Israel out of captivity and slavery, and he conquered over the tyranny of the enemy Pharaoh, that they would go forth to worship him and trust always in his faithful work and promises. So now when the Christian prays, Lord, show us your work, we're reminded that Christ has brought us out of captivity and slavery to sin. He has conquered over the tyranny of the enemy, Satan, and he has set us free that we would worship him and trust always in his faithful work and promises. And so, church, we ought to pray. Lord, let your redemptive work be shown to us and your glorious power to believers throughout all generation. See, friends, we always need to have the Lord's work and faithfulness before us. That his gospel, good news, in fact, would permeate our entire life. That when we struggle, when we stumble, we're reminded that God is faithful. As Moses had saying in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, he is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. See, again, I think we return to that point that all that God does is good. And all that he is is true and right. And so with humbled hearts, we ought to seek what is good and true and right in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, notice finally that in verse 17, Moses prays, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Now, the beginning of verse 17 is really a reference to the Lord's presence. In fact, the word favor is also translated as beauty elsewhere, and it describes the Lord's good and wonderful presence. In fact, Psalm 27 verse 4 says, One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty, the favor of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. See, in Moses' prayer, he is asking to have the Lord's presence upon him and the people of God. And we find this even similarly in Exodus 33. Moses spoke to the Lord saying in verse 13, If I have found favor in your sight... Please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And the Lord had said to Moses in the very next verse, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Again, this reminds us that in all of life, we are wholly dependent upon the presence and the power and the peace of God Almighty. And so we ought to pray, Lord, let your favor, your beautiful presence be upon us. 
And finally, notice in the second half of verse 17, we ought to pray and ask the Lord to establish the work of our hands. And here Moses confirms this twice, almost as putting a Hebrew exclamation point in the way of repetition. And again, I think we're reminded that there is no part, there's no time in the Christian life when we can boast in our works. Rather, we are wholly dependent upon God alone as we humbly pray, Lord, may you establish the work of our hands. See, ultimately, the scriptures teach us that it is not our work, but it is what God works in us that establishes and accomplishes. Even in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 12, we read, O Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all our works. Again, from the beginning to end, all that the believer does, all that the believer accomplishes is the work of God worked out in them. In fact, this is why. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 to the believer, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so friends, God has established the greatest work in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we should not view our works as a way to earn or gain pleasure before God, but what he establishes in those he loves. Again, I think this is what brings true and genuine favor of God's presence to the believer found in Christ. And this is also what brings the greatest purpose and joy to our works. We are not working to earn God's presence. We are not working in hopes that we have peace with God, but because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. With joy, we go and do good works. We ask the Lord, would you establish the work of our hands? Again, as I've reminded you many times, it's in the same way when I tell my sons to take out the trash, to do a certain thing. It doesn't determine if they are my sons. It's because they are my sons of which I call them to do those works as part of our household. And so, brothers and sisters, be encouraged by what the scriptures tell us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Church, in this whole prayer of Psalm 90, we're reminded that from our understanding of who God is to our affliction and our affections and even our works before God, we are wholly dependent upon him in all things. And so we ought to devote ourselves to prayer, not just in the service, Not just making sure we're here at 945 for pre-service prayer, but we ought to devote ourselves to a life of prayer, not neglecting or ignoring this important practice in the Christian life. But again, there are distractions. There are so many things in our lives, some of which are good and the Lord is placed in our lives. And yet we often forget those things of which are so important for the Christian's assurance and practice and good works. Again, even in J.C. Ryle's little book on prayer, he says backsliding generally first begins with neglect of private prayer. Bibles read without prayer. Sermons heard without prayer. Marriages entered without prayer, journeys undertaken without prayer, and homes chosen without prayer. And so simply put, we ought to pray. We ought to be reminded continually how great and good our God is and how he calls us to commune with him 
and depend upon him. And so, dear friends, this morning, if you are backslidden and you long to return to the Lord, for the Lord to return to you, pray. If you are lazy and apathetic in your Christian living, you ought to pray. What does James tell us but to have the elders come to us and pray over us? If you are struggling, you ought to call upon your elders. You ought to call upon your church members that you would more faithfully pray for them and even for yourself. If you long to see the redemptive works of God and be satisfied in your Savior, pray. And if you rejoice and you are glad, even in the affliction of what the Lord has brought, keep Praying. For again, in all these things, we are reminded in those times of prayer that we are exercising faith, that we are showing how much we desire to commune with God and how much we are not dependent upon ourselves, but upon the Lord in all things. And so let's go to prayer. Lord, we give you great thanks and praise for your word. Lord, we have been reminded how important prayer is in our living. Lord, we ask that, as the psalmist says, may you search us and know us. May you point out in us any way that offends you, and may you lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, we we ask that if there are trials, there are troubles among your people. Lord, we know many of them. Lord, may you set our minds on things above. May you remind us, Lord, that there is There is nothing wrong in a struggling believer praying to you and saying, Lord, I need help. Lord, may you remind those who have a tendency to isolate that they ought to not only call upon you in prayer, but call upon their churchmen to pray with them and for them. Lord, may you remind us that we are wholly dependent upon you. And just as we have gathered to commune with you this morning, you have reminded us that through Christ we have access to the Father, to the throne of grace, to receive help in time of need. And so, Lord, remind us of these things. That as we go into a new week, may you remind us that you've brought us safely through a previous week. And that, Lord, in all things we are dependent on upon you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all of this. Amen.